topic today was about interactive architecture. So how architecture itself is changing today because of uh, digital technologies. The internet has changed our lives over the past 10, 20 years, but now the internet is entering physical space. The internet is becoming internet of things. It's creating a new hybrid dimension between bits and datums, between the digital world and, uh, and the physical world. And that dimension helps us really to sense space around ourselves, but also to have space around ourselves to respond to us. So architecture can become more and more dynamic. Architecture we've seen in a beautiful way how it can interact with people because people move, but also architecture itself can become something that responds in a dynamic way. And that's actually the first project I did at MIT when I, when I got there over 10 years ago. It was a project where we explore uh, a surface that would become like a living surface. It was a surface made of sand. Then you had a laser scanner at the top, scanning the dead space uh, uh, in real time and then sending back information to the surface. So they become like a living surface. But when we were doing the project at the Media Lab with Hiroshi Ishii, we had a dream. And the dream was, imagine one day when the surface itself of the sand could move by its own. Imagine one day when actually the computer itself could control that surface. So at the time we tried, um, but we didn't succeed. 10 years ago, you, know, you didn't have the same electronics you have today. You didn't have the same ability to really create uh, control. So it was uh, really exciting to see that just uh, over a year ago, Hiroshi Ishii, with whom we were working at the time, uh, managed to create a surface that does something like that. It becomes like a living surface. You see here that moves uh, uh, controlled dynamically. The, the person is not there. Actually, the person is quite far. Uh, but remotely, you can capture in three dimensions the person and then transmit that movement uh, uh, at a distance. As a kind of an experiment following what we did with, uh, with Hiroshi, uh, that was just uh, a few weeks ago at Milan, at Milan Design Week. Um, we were asked by Vitra, uh, a Swiss uh, furniture house, uh, to think about how spaces around ourselves are changing. A few years ago, you'd go home, you sit on a sofa, you'd open a, a newspaper, it was a printed newspaper, uh, but today you're doing that in a different way, and we want more responsive, responsive spaces. So what we did here was actually something quite similar, um, by looking at the same idea when it becomes like a space around yourself where you can, uh, you can be and you can enjoy different configurations. You have an element, this element is controllable, so it, go up and it goes up and down, you can control it from, from your uh, app, or you can control it just with your hands, you put the hand very close to it, or quite high, and then you can actually create a space with different configurations uh, uh, around yourself, in a dynamic, uh, responsive way. And so, you know, that's what we've been trying to explore in, uh, really over the past few years, in different ways, in a lot of the things we've been doing, how spaces around ourselves can start responding to us in a different way. We were asked by, um, uh, again recently by Cassina, another uh, producer of, uh, of furniture, to think about something that would become both uh, like a traditional interactive element with, uh, with the sofa. You go home, you read a newspaper on the sofa, today you might go home and just uh, tweet or read the same newspaper and digitally on a, on a tablet. So the idea to have something could be like a coffee table or a place to to write or a place to, to engage friends. That's a very interesting idea, but you know, no material exists to actually do something like that. When we proposed the, the idea, actually we had a couple of, uh, of thoughts about how that could be done. And today we can do a lot of digital fabrication. It means uh, uh, if you look at this, uh, we can uh, do many elements such as this one, but slightly different, one slightly different from the other because they're all laser cut. In the past, in the 20th century, we had to do everything the same. Today we can actually look at things that are slightly different from each other and then when you combine them, you can create some kind of implicit programming in the way that they can take different configurations. So you see here the same piece, each of them is slightly different and so it allows you to take the configuration to the left or to the center or, or to the right. Here you can see how this you know, became then uh, uh, the final thing, cutting each of them uh, with a laser. The laser is uh, the same thing that we use in most architecture schools these days just slightly bigger, it's the same thing that's going to produce the, the final product. And then when you assemble them, each of them parametrically different than the other, you can create this shape, this material that basically responds to, to different configuration in a, in a dynamic way. So it's almost like implicit programming, it's like this, you can open it up and take, uh, take different shapes. We also experimented quite a bit with, uh, with information on walls in, uh, in this project. We looked at something that's uh, quite simple, it's like a projector, like the ones you have here all around. Uh, but on that projector, you have in front of it a rotating mirror controlled by, by a computer. The rotating mirror makes uh, is such that basically from that point, you can actually project it 360 degrees around, uh, around yourself. 
And uh, so every surface uh, potentially can become a, a, a living surface through digital information. So what you see here is actually the, uh, the space where this surface can be project a projection surface or another one. So the whole space was really built in a way that uh, this could be off like this, or you turn it on and the architecture would be such, the co-visibility of surface would be such that every surface could become like a, a digitally responsive one. So it could be like this, but then if you turn on, on the projector, then everything could become like a, a living animated wall. Uh, the same thing can be also very important when we look at uh, the energy consuming buildings. Now, if you think about it, today there's something quite absurd. We have put a lot of energy to heat or cool empty spaces. If you think about the United States during the winter, we use a lot of energy in buildings. Think about our homes. During the day, we're not there. We're in our offices. They're empty, but we still heat them or cool them. And the same for our office buildings. During the night, they're empty, but still we heat them or cool them. And in this paper, we looked at a few years ago about where energy is consumed on the, on the MIT campus and uh, where people are. And what you find, as you see on this graph, is that there's no correlation whatsoever. There's no correlation, so we keep on heating or cooling spaces or using lights in spaces even when nobody's there. So we started thinking about, you know, could we think about a, a different way of doing things? Imagine that heat or cool is actually following people, um, that we don't heat or cool the entire space, but just where people are. We started with this idea of local warming. Can we create this bubble of heat that actually follows people as they move through space? This was the first test we did at MIT. What you see there is the main entrance at MIT, 77 Massachusetts Avenue. People would step on the carpet and then this bubble of heat would start following them. Uh, some people freaked out, uh, but most people loved it. So that was a test about, you know, you could also customize your bubble. You could do it at different temperatures based on your, your own preferences. And, uh, and that led actually to, uh, to this that you see here. Uh, it's two pictures, one next to the other, but it was at the, Ven at the past Venice Biennale an art and architecture exhibition where, as you see here, the fall ceiling would uh, supplement heating in a dynamic way for people um, around it. So you see here this bubble of heat that would follow people as they move under the, the space. And, uh, and here's a little video of how that was made. Uh, so each of those elements creates a collimated beam through sensors would actually follow people as they move underneath. So that was the making of the, the exhibition at the, at the Venice Biennale. And you see, here you wanted to make it quite visible, being an exhibition, to, to show how it works. But you can imagine the same thing in the future that becomes slightly integrated in a full ceiling. Just you know, imagine infrared LEDs that supplement heating or cooling in buildings where, just where we need it. So again, an architecture becomes almost alive that responds to us in a, in a dynamic way. When it turns on, you see this bubble of heat that follows people as they, they move here in a visible way, but you could make it really almost in, uh, invisible. And I want to finish with, um, uh, with another project that we did, uh, in this case for the World Expo, that was a few years ago. The theme of the Expo was water. So the mayor asked us, could we do a building totally made of water? This was the entrance of, of the international exhibition. Uh, no doors or windows, this water would be digitally controlled, uh, so you could write or show images or text. Inside all the walls would expand and shrink, based on how many people you, you have in the space was the main entrance, then the bridge was a Zaha Did bridge that would lead to the exhibition. If there was too much wind, you could lower the roof to minimize splashing. And then at the end of the day, you could actually close the building and the whole architecture would, would disappear. Hopefully without anybody underneath. Well, we, we, we had sensors for that as well. Um, well, you know, that was, uh, that was the building. Um, we, we had a lot of fun doing it and doing the, the video. We were not sure they would actually build it. But then what happened is that just uh, six months before the Expo, Time magazine named, put it in the list of the, the best invention of the year. We had to build it very, very quickly. That was the picture before the opening. I like this picture because you see that guy had a trolley, was going to the station, but then stopped there for five minutes to say, you know, what the hell is happening here? Here was myself uh, trying, uh, interacting with the water. You see projections on the water, so the pixel, the digital pixels and the physical pixel overlap on each other. So the building is made of thousands of sensors that detect people as they move, as they approach it. One night, you know, all of this is controlled by a computer. The computer crashed and the building stopped responding to people. And uh, that night we were terrified because the building would keep on doing its own crazy things and cuts and holes and images and text and pattern, but without responding to people anymore. However, that night was one of the most fun nights ever. That night, thousands of kids from all over the city went to the building to play a new game. Not anymore a building that opens up when you approach it, but the building that you need to engage like this.
It is a video, it's, it's small because it's a low-res video taken from YouTube. You find a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, for us, it was an important lesson because as architects, as engineers, we always think that we know how people will, will use the stuff we design. But then reality, and especially human reality, is always a surprise. In this case, it was a good surprise. Thank you.